Autistic monotropism was making its rounds on Instagram and YouTube a year or so ago, and many posed it as a new way of conceptualising what autism is. Whilst it's an interesting concept that explains the focus styles of autistic people, the real power of monotropism is found in its ability to reframe the perspectives and the behaviours of other people. Welcome, friend, to the dark side of the autistic community. I'm Thomas Henley, and today we're going to be speaking on the idea of autistic monotropism. Monotropism is a relatively new concept born out of the lived experience and actualized by autistic researchers. It explains an autistic person's tendency to focus on one thing, one object, or one activity and a lack of perceptive ability and attention to other things which are outside of that one thing. In childhood, it might look like the Minecraft dinosaur or Roblox kid who struggles to engage with anything in school unless it somehow relates to their interests. However, in adulthood, it might look like having a craving for a few specific interests and finding anything outside of those interests incredibly draining unreasonably exhausting. This isn't the only way of thinking about monotropism. It can be more acute in nature too. You may have heard of concepts like autistic inertia before, a concept which explains why we can find it hard to start a task, but also to stop a task once we've got going. Sort of like a train, where it takes us a while to get going, you know, firing up the engines, but slamming on the brakes at top speed can lead to a disaster, perhaps a meltdown, perhaps a shutdown, perhaps dysregulating you for the entire day. Let's go into some of the ways this concept may help us as autistic people self-advocate just a little bit better. Number one, respecting and supporting innate differences. Understanding monotropism solidifies our attention style, the way that our brain works, as an immutable characteristic. Quite often, people don't understand why it's harder for us to switch tasks, take on another task that we didn't realise that we were going to have to do, or take on pieces of information during our focus time, when we're doing something else. Abruptly pulling us out of autistic inertia, at the least, can lead to a very, very long transition time and a large amount of anxiety. And at the most, it can lead to meltdown or overwhelm. Without the knowledge and proper respect for our monotropic brains, people may place the blame on us for reacting in such a way, or being unable to switch as quickly as them, believing that it's something that we're doing intentionally, something that we're just doing to be difficult, something that we're doing because we want to stay within that task, even though in situations that I've been in my life, sometimes I am engaged in a task that I don't like, like doing the washing, you know? I don't enjoy that, but for some reason, once I've got going, once I've been doing that washing for a while, I just find that it's, it's incredibly difficult to switch my brain off into anything else, even if it's something that I enjoy, even if it's a video game, even if it's sports, even if it's Muay Thai, even at the end of my day. With the newfound knowledge and understanding that's brought by monotropism, managers, or indeed partners in romantic relationships or friends, may plan the day ahead, give more patience, more transition time around task switching, and during urgent situations, give more respect and show more gratitude for the stress, the added stress that we may go through due to the style of our brain. I think this can be applicable in multiple different situations, from manager to employee, teacher to student, parent to child, partner to partner. This is perhaps the most impactful aspect to monotropism, as it removes the blame that's put on a person for their inherent trait, that immutable characteristic, the way that their brain works, and encourages other people to adapt to our unique brain, or at least show some degree of respect, some degree of understanding for the way that our brain works, not jumping to conclusions about the the behind the scenes things, the things, you know, our ulterior motive, perhaps malevolent intent. <laughs> Human beings 
just in general. You know, we tend to think that everybody thinks the way that we do and that life is perceived in the exact same way that we do. And it's sometimes a little bit difficult for some people to put themselves in other people's shoes or sort of acknowledge that life can be so different and our brains can be so different. Number two, sensory differences matter. Indeed. We know that autistic people have altered atypical sensory systems, meaning that different senses can be hyper or hyposensitive, but people often do not understand how they can impact our social experience, how they can impact our focus, ability to work, ability to engage with a task. With monotropism, we establish a pinpoint focus on one thing, and it brings us a lot of comfort, sort of like a happy flow state. But what happens when other factors are involved? Think of a noisy restaurant, or perhaps a classroom. I'm sure there's many of you out there, particularly autistic, but I'd say everybody probably has this experience of not being able to concentrate, or not engaging someone properly, or not listening to what someone says because of the environment around you. Maybe you don't even get work done because there is something in your environment that's taking your attention. Something that I think a lot of people can relate to. The thing is, our autistic brains can sort of amplify and normalise surrounding sounds, making it very hard to suppress the attention-grabbing effects of noise. But it's not a purposeful lack of interest in conversation or the quality of it, we just struggle with those multiple inputs. I would argue that a lot of autistic people, generally if you're having a one-to-one -one conversation and you're both very engaged, they tend to be extremely focused on what someone is saying, you know, paying attention a lot to what they're saying, lis listening well, you know, uh, contributing to conversation well. But in those situations, it can kind of seem like we aren't. It can kind of seem like we're sort of disinterested in people. So some people may call us out on this rudeness or question our interest in what they're saying and who they are. But it's as a result of our sensory differences and our monotropic attention style combined into one. Sort of a mismatch of the two, sort of conflicting with each other. Another sort of opposite example that I could give for this is when I used to compete in Taekwondo, when I used to go training, one of the things that I really struggled to do was to train hard, but also socialize with other people. It's kind of like I had two modes. I could either talk a lot to people and sort of breeze through the training a little bit, or train really hard and just not speak to anyone. And it's very, 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 very difficult if I am wholly engaged, wholly focused on that training to actually speak to other people. And even I've had situations where people have tried to speak and they've said something to me pretty loud, but I'm just so laser focused in on what I'm doing that it's difficult for me to notice that they've said anything, acknowledge their presence, I guess. So perhaps better venue selections, perhaps more patience would be considered in these circumstances when you're thinking of any type of scenario involving two people or more. I really love these headphones, but they do have a tendency of dropping out my ears. I have very, very, I have deceptively small ear, ear canals, you know, a little bit of Thomas Law in there, Thomas Facts, I really need to clean these as well. <clears throat> Number three, job selection. A great aspect of understanding your own monotropic mind is that you have a better idea of the types of jobs that might be more suitable for you. Now, autistic people can be polytropic, spontaneous. I mean, a lot of people who are ADHD may have different experiences of autism due to the added ADHD in the mix. I know that it can look a lot different for different people, but for autistic people, we do tend to struggle with neurotypical communication, sensory distress, and are likely to have a monotropic focus style. So perhaps it might be a better idea to avoid social heavy jobs if you want the energy to socialise in your free time for leisure with friends, work somewhere without a lot of noise, and opt for jobs 
that can really let you lock in for long periods of time, something that's a lot more predictable and less subject to change on the daily. I do want to highlight that obviously this doesn't mean throw out your dream job, but when you have these factors like this in your workplace, you may need to make some adjustments long term to offset any present difficulties. It doesn't mean that you can't do stuff, it just may mean that you need to make some adjustments yourself or ask for some adjustments if you feel it wouldn't be at risk, sort of put you at risk for your job. And perhaps consider moving into professions or aiming to move into professions that might allow you to be a bit more focused in on one thing, free from distractions. The last but equally important consequence of having a monotropic mind is how it affects your ability to manage or juggle multiple things in your life. Executive dysfunction is highly related to autism and indeed a number of different neurodivergencies and mental health conditions. And it means that we can have some significant difficulties in managing everyday life tasks. Cooking, cleaning, doing taxes, um, walking the dog, all of those little, little things that sort of add up and make up someone's day that isn't just like work. I mean, it can be related to work, but it's it's everything in life combined into one. When we have lots and lots of different little, little things that we have to keep track of to maintain, we can find it a lot more exhausting than perhaps having a day where we just do a few select things. You know, we go to work, we have one project that we're working on. We come home, it's our cleaning day. You know, we go, the next day is our, is our cooking day. We, we batch make meals. It's a little bit easier to, to manage in that sense. But when it is, when a lot of different things are condensed into a short period of time, sometimes we can find it very, very difficult to maintain that over the long term. I think the important caveat here that a lot of people get wrong when hearing about executive dysfunction is that it doesn't mean that we lack the ability to do something. It just means that long-term upkeeping those tasks, staying on track of those tasks is much more difficult for us to manage and not let it destabilize and deregulate us in that long term. It's the difference between saying that you can't cook a meal and being able to cook meals consistently throughout the week, no matter what happens. I think monotropism explains to a certain degree why it can be stressful or difficult to manage those multiple small little life tasks in the long term. I find that the less tasks I have to do, the better and more stable I feel. The benefit to understanding monotropism in this context is that it will help other people consider the relatively high difficulty that managing life tasks can offer. You know, it's not just related to laziness or just that you don't want to do stuff. It's related to inertia. It's related to the transition times. It's related to managing managing time, managing the, the things and the order of things that you do in a day, estimating how long things will take you as opposed to other things. I think it helps people give us more empathy and more encouragement in finding different ways to approach managing these life things. It can also be beneficial in an individual sense, as this understanding can help you adjust the way that you manage your tasks week on week. You can sort of change the way that you approach stuff. Perhaps maybe in one day you would do a lot of different things, but you would maintain them. You would do like half an hour of one thing and half an hour of another thing and half an hour of another thing. Um, perhaps you may want to change things around, try and find different ways of setting out your week so that the things that you need to get done, get done, but you just manage it in a different way, which is better for you and the way that you, your brain works. The solutions are endless, but just having the knowledge that this might be a better way of approaching it or that you're not lazy or that you're not, you're not a, a bad sort of sloth-like person because you find it difficult to to manage these life things, but actually just because, you know, generally the way that people manage things isn't the most applicable to you. And perhaps you just need a bit of a unique perspective, a unique way of tackling these issues. 
Once you and the others around you understand the strengths and the weaknesses of the monotropic brain, it opens doors to finding solutions to struggles and encourages you to adapt your life in ways that you can capitalize on your strengths, not only mitigate your weaknesses. Make sure to like and subscribe to your boy if you're new here. If you found this helpful and consider becoming a member for as little as 99p, it helps me as a relatively short creator, short creator? I'm not sure, I'm tall. Relatively small creator. <laughs> and you get a ton of different awesome perks. Make sure to check out my new Inside the Autiverse channel in the description if you're looking for some awesome commentary style videos. Link in the description, of course, or you can just check it out on the end screen. I hope you are well, and remember to stay hydrated, you interruptibly challenged sausage.